Hey, Connie. So we are here again. Hey, glad <laughs> to be back. Yeah, it was a bit of a break, wasn't it? But um, yeah, we just holidays, right? In a, um, in the summer. Yeah, we should be so lucky to have three week holidays here in the states, right? <laughs> so. uh, yeah, people are different. So it's so, so yeah, it's going okay. But we're back to start cracking on, right? So uh, yeah, uh, let, I think we can just get started because I I noticed that the. Uh, this module is a lot to do as well. And last time we just managed to finish this one and that was about 94 exercises and this is about 94 exercises as well. So let's try and crack it out basically. Yeah, let's roll. Cool. Um, so if I just uh, share my screen and go into this mode. Right, uh, so we are here, learn CSS colors by building a by building a set of colored markers so just gonna start the project and we'll start coding so as you've seen in our previous projects web pages should start with a doc type html declaration followed by a html element add a doc type html declaration at the top of the document and add and an html element after that Give the HTML element a lang attribute with n as its value. Ah, so it's beginning to really um, get Test me. Test your memory a little bit. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it is to actually testing my memory because um, I, uh, yeah, it's been a while since, <laughs> it's been three weeks. So um, let me see if I can do something with that. So uh, let's see, stock type HTML. I think that was it, right? Uh, you're missing an exclamation point, or we would say in programming bang, the bang symbol, right before the doc type word. At the very beginning, inside the um, first open. Yep, right there. Yep, there you go. Okay. And then web pages is followed by HTML element. So we've done a declaration and a HTML element after that is it lang lang mm -hmm. this should hopefully let's try this yeah you need a closing html tag ah uh, yes uh let me just There we are. That's it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That might be like the hardest thing I'd ask you to remember. Everything else is a new learning as we go. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's the head element within the HTML element. And um, just after the head element, add a body element. So what I want you to notice here, right, you know, and, and all of the listeners and the future listeners here is notice as you go, you have the big picture of the HTML document right there. Uh, instead of just honing in on your in the line of editing, notice that you have doc type, HTML, closing and opening tag. So if you notice those things, you'll get to feel for what the HTML document should look like and kind of the big picture thing. Just every once in a while, kind of take a peek at that. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so yep, uh, we are here. Um, so we're inside the HTML element. So they want me to add a head element. So okay, and just after the head element, add a body element. So we will just add a body element. Uh, we need closing tags, don't we? Yes. Yes. So let's just uh, do that and head. And body, what will do also body. And this is your basic HTML document. Doc type at the top, HTML surrounding head and body inside that HTML. That's your basic HTML document. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, hi, Constantine. Just saw that. Yep. Hey, Constantine. Good to see you. Um, so, okay, so let's just check the code. Yep, that's fine. So we will go ahead on the next one. 
Uh, remember that the title element uh, gives search engines extra information about the page. It also tells browsers what text to display in the title bar when the page is open and on a tab for the page. Within the head element, nest the title element with the text colored markers. So, uh, so within the head element, okay, cool. Title. And then we'll call it colored markers. And then that can't be right. Yep, don't forget you can do control enter to submit and check. Yeah. I shall do that. Yeah, <laughs> been a while. Keep your hands on the keyboard. Yeah, I'll ask him later. But I know Connie does. So I do donate. Yes, it's a great, a great organization to support. Yes, uh, uh, def I, I will do that as well after I finish all of this. Um, to tell browsers uh, how to encode characters on your page, set the char set to UTF-8. UTF-8 is a universal character set that includes almost every character from all human languages. Inside the head element, nests a meta element with the attribute char set to UTF-8. Remember that meta elements are self-closing and do not need a closing tag. So uh, we want to inside the head ed element nest a meta element. So we need to uh, do meta and then uh, char set equals and then UTF-8. Hopefully that is how it is. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to remember, be remembering these things actually, even after like what, three weeks out? I yeah. still remember a few things, which is good. Yep. That UTF-8 is not case sensitive, so it could be capitals also in case anybody's wondering. Uh, so finally, use a viewport meta tag to make sure your page looks the same on all devices. Nest a self-closing meta element within the head. Uh, give it a name attribute set to viewport and a content attribute set to width equals device equals width. Initial scale equals 1.0. So let's see what we can do uh, here. So first of all, we need to nest a self-closing meta element within the head, which we need to do a new one, right? So mm -hmm. um, we will do meta and then we will do yeah, set to viewport and the content attribute. Well, the name, the attributes is name. So like uh, instead of viewport. Uh, yeah, it's name. Yep. Yeah. And then it's is it brackets, right? No, at this point it's still a name uh, value pair. So name equals viewport. Ah, yes, 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 that's right. And then space. Yeah, content equals width. Oh, oh wait, and a content attribute. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing is set to that value. Right. Okay. Width equals device dash width uh, initial scale equals zero. Okay. Take a look at that. Yeah, that doesn't seem right to me. No, 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 no. That was correct. Um, so width equals, and right now you have a dash there. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's and it. there's another, there's another issue. Back over to the uh, after the name viewport, and then you have another, another attribute content. Yeah. When you have more than one, what more than one attribute in a tag, you separate them by just a space. You do not need commas. 
Uh, see. Yeah, there you go. Now try. Wait, wait. Uh, oh, correct. Okay, so look, it did not catch that you don't have a closing angle bracket on your meta. Do you see that? Okay, but, oh, go to oh, the very end. All right. Yeah, yeah. This. So they need to. I didn't have this, right? Yeah, so, you you should have that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering what would happen if I had a comma here. Good question. Let's find out. Oh, it liked it anyway. It liked but, it. <laughs> okay, so a little very forgiving here. I think it's because I checked it and then it just went. So when I press Possibly. control, that's so that's what happens. So Possibly, yeah. Okay. Now, now you're ready to start adding content to the page. Within the body, nest the uh, H1 element with the text CSS color markers. So we are going to do uh, H1 uh, equals, oh my gosh, my, uh, and then it will be, yes, uh, that will be that, CSS color. Uh, H1, uh, right, cool. Uh, in this project, you work with an external CSS file to style the page. We've already created a style.css file for you, but before you can use it, you'll need to link it to the page. Nest a link element within the head. I give it a row attribute set to style sheet and an href attribute set to styles of CSS. So we've already, so they created the file for me, cell the CSS. So they want me to nest a link element within the head and then give a row attribute. So I need to nest a, uh is it link mm -hmm. but yeah but um then how would i what is it called sales dot well that's the value of the href you need two attributes here you need a rel and an href and they're telling you what to set those two here you need rel so unless so give it a rel attribute there you go and then set it to style sheet. Correct. And then we will need an href attribute and we will set that to styles.css. Correct. And close. Yep. So that should be, I think that's it. So, yep. perfect. Uh, okay, now that your external CSS file is set up, you can start styling the page. As a reminder, here's how to target a paragraph element and align it to the right. Create a new CSS rule that targets a H1 element and set its text align property to center. So we uh, need to create a, um, so we need to target H1. Then we need to do that. Then we need to set text dash align and then we need to do like so and yeah perfect great um now you add some elements that you will eventually style into color markers first within the body add a div element and uh, set its class attribute to container make sure the div element is below the h1 element so First within the body, add a div element. And set its class. Uh, is it like so? What's the name of the attribute here? So that's class attribute. Yeah. Class equals container. Yeah. Right. Reading it from left to right, but <laughs> they haven't done that. Uh, yeah. Make sure the div element is below the H1 element. So that's done. So let's just check that. Now it's still pass. Why? Now it. Now it's checking. Yeah. 
No, it's well, it's there actually we should have an opening div tag. So something's up with the logic because the fact is they are no you, when a div is not self closing. All oh, right, okay. So we need to have a div that I see what's happened. Um so basically this is the opening tag. And this is, and that's what they mean by that. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah, yeah but yeah, now it's actually checked it for that. I think it, it can't actually check it for um, the self closing tags. I think that's what's happening. It's not, um, it can check for obviously closing tags, but not the self closing tags. Probably so. Good job. Uh, so next within the div, add an, another div element and give it a class more class. So we're next within the div, we are going to uh, add another div element and give it a class of markers. So, so we're going to, again, do the same thing. Class equals, uh, equals marker. And then we're going to have a closing and finish div here. We'll check your code. Uh, what you should, unless you need div element within the div with the class container. Ah, I see. Okay, cool. So I need to copy, cut this, and paste this here. Yep. Cool. So it's time to add some color to the page. Remember that one way to add color to an element is to use a color keyword like black, sign, or yellow. As a reminder, here's how to target the class free code camp. Free code camp, uh, create a new CSS rule that targets a class marker and set its background color property to red. Okay, so I need to go on to target the class, create a new CSS rule that targets the. So we need to. Target the class marker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just <clears throat> I need to do marker and then I need to do that. And then I need to do background uh, dash color. Uh, and then that should be uh, uh, red. Okay, look at your um, your class selector marker. You're missing something. This mark. is one of those remember how to do it thing. Okay, so there's an example, free code camp. Yeah, uh, let me have no oh yeah, you need to do full stop to actually do the class. There you go. That's right. And uh, you also should have a semicolon at the end, but it didn't mind that. Yeah. But um to be strict, I mean sometimes you don't like I said before in previous videos, uh if you're if you don't have the the uh strict indicated, that will let you get away with things like not having uh yeah. semicolons at the end. Okay. Notice that your marker doesn't seem to have any color. The background color was actually applied, but since the marker div element is empty, it doesn't have any height by default. In your uh, dot marker CSS rule, set the width property to 200 pixels and the height property to 25 pixels. So we will need to then do um, uh, width. And that is something to, to mention about a concept if you are just learning HTML and CSS, a good distinction to make is that even though you've defined an element like a div on your page, if you look over here at the uh, preview, there is no, there is nothing there, even though we set the background to red. Um, that's because your elements don't have any width or height until you give them that or until they inherit that or have that property for through some other means. So that was something that as I was learning, it kind of like dawned on me. It's like, oh yeah, um, I actually have to, to give it some kind of um, uh, area like width or height before I can um, see anything on the page. So just keep that in mind if you're not finding something sometimes, that might be why. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I just uh, want to do, yeah, you point out that, yes, this is quite funny. It is. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Ez az Ambalin, vagy a Fenni Bárki, just trying and go for it, right? Uh, okay, so this I have red color, but of course, um, you just check the code. Uh, click into here. Yep, it passes a code, so we'll go into the next one. Uh, in your marker would look better if it was centered on the page. An easy way to do that is with the margin short, shorthand property. In the last project, you said the margin area of elements separate with properties like margin top and margin left. The margin shorthand property makes it easy to set multiple margin areas at the same time. To center your marker on a page, set its margin property to auto. This sets margin top, margin right, margin bottom, and margin left all to auto. So, yeah, I think we had a disc. I remember this last um, last lesson we were discussing this as well, right? Yeah. If if you have this is like the shorthand version. Remember that it goes in order from like a clock, top, right, uh, bottom, left, like that in order. If you were writing them individually, and also the shorthand because you can separate them you can put them in quotes and separate by a space if you wanted to define each of those differently if they're all the same you can use just one value and it'll just apply it to all of them and uh, by the way Kaminsky I hope you're working through these with us buddy that would be great let us know how it's going uh, hopefully <laughs> that's it. um right okay so uh Let's see where we're going. Um, uh, so the next one is, now that you've got one marker centered with color, it's time to add the other markers. In the container div, add two more div elements and give them each a class of marker. So what we need to do is, in the container div, add two more div elements. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, in the container div, add two more div elements and give them each a class of marker. Uh, so basically, they just want to, in, in your outside uh, container, we want three markers. Yep. So if you weren't here before, we had a discussion about cut and paste versus typing things out. And um, sometimes it's just better to uh, type things out because you want to get things in your hands and really know what you're doing. Um, and if you're cut and paste all the time, you'll be at a place where it's going to ask you to do something and you just it just doesn't come to you because it's never gone through your brain, you know, to the, through your hands to the keyboard before, because you've always cut and pasted. So until you're very comfortable with that, you should always just go ahead and type things out. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, so the next one is, well, you have three separate marker div elements. They look like one big rectangle. You should add some space between them to make it easier to see each element. When a shorthand margin property has two values, it sets margin top and margin bottom uh, to the first value and margin left and margin right to the second value. In your marker CSS rule, set the margin property to 10 pixel auto. So they want me in my so they want me to set the margin property to 10 pixel. So this is just showing that you can actually set it like to be auto, but with a certain size, right? Yeah, so what this is doing is it's using the shorthand, but that first and that second value there, the first one is gonna be for your top and your bottom. That second one's gonna be for your left and you're right, and that's why we're seeing a little bit of margin in between. And our right and left really didn't change at all. So, mm. yeah. Okay, it's submitted. So, in school, you might have learned that red, yellow, and blue are primary colors, and then how to create new colors by mixing those. However, this is an outdated model. These days, there are two main color models 
the additive RGB uh, and using electronic devices and a subtractive CMYK uh, for model used in print. In this project, you'll work with the RGB model. Uh, let me see. So first add the class one to the first marker um, development. So let me see. So this is my first uh, marker and it's asked me to add, uh, first add the class one to the first, I'm, ju I'm sorry. One the second. example is really helpful here. So in the example, we have a class equals with two different class names. So what they're saying here is that to add more than one class, you're just going to keep them inside the quotes, separate by a space. Yep, just like. Only we don't want the word class in there. We just want the name of the class. So what's oh. the name of the class you're adding? Yep, exactly. Oh, marker one, marker two, marker three. OK. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, this is a little bit, it's like when I say first add the class, I was going to write the class one. Yeah, uh, yeah but I, I don't think they should have this, um, you know, bolded like this, but that's... that's oh, it. yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's a little misleading. Um, so, so the next one is next remove the background color property and its value from the dot marker CSS rule. So uh, next remove the background color property. So they want me to just basically remove this property and its value. So that's all they want. Okay. Um, then create a new CSS rule that targets the class one and sets its background color property to red. So let's see where I'm, I've got H1 marker. And so, so I'm going to be targeting dot one. Uh, or is it dot marker one? That's just one. That's the class name. Yeah. And then that, so we should set the background color property to uh, red. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So that works, which is great. So uh, let's see. Let's just check. Uh, I know this was a bit of a while ago, but I was um, I was kind of busy with, <laughs> with the coding. So just checking constantly where you at now with this. Are you trying to catch up, or are you just watching us? Here, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll just hide this uh, and then. Let me see on the next one. Uh, uh, add the class two to the second marker div and the class three to the third marker div. Um, let me see. So I need to add the class two to the second marker div. So that's what they want. And class three. Yeah, in, in this one, they actually say, like I said before, you know, they actually yeah. don't do the class like like so yeah yeah that's fine uh so create a css rule that targets a class two and set its background color property to green also create a separate css rule that targets a class three and sets its background color to blue so we need to first of all target class two and then we will need to push out background color to uh, green. And then create a separate CSS rule. So that would be the three. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much the same. Background color to blue. Awesome, so that's all done. Earlier, you should learn that the RGP color model is additive. Uh, additive. Uh, this means that colors begin as black and ch change as different levels of red, green, and blue are introduced. An easy way to see this is with the CSS RGB function. 
Create a new CSS row that targets a class container and set its background color to, to black with RGB 000. So first of all, I need to do container. Then I need to uh, do this, background color. And then I need to do that, but then I need to do RGB. And uh, let's hope this works. Yeah, it has done. Brilliant. So, yeah, we can see that over here on the right. So, it's very cool. That is done. So, a function is a piece of code uh, that can take an input and perform a specific action. The CSS RGB function accepts values or arguments for red green and blue and produces a color. Each red, green, and blue value is a number from zero to 255. Zero means that there's a 0% of that color and is black. 255 means that there's a 100% of that color. And in the dot one CSS rule, replace the color keyword red with the RGB function. And uh, yeah, so for the, so let's just set the RGB function. And then what do they want? They want me to set 255 for red, um, the value for green zero, and the value for blue is zero. So they that has set, but I'm not sure if that's right. But I guess it is right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, what you're saying is give me all red, no green, no blue. That's RGB. So each of your your, your placeholders there, each of your I, arguments. Uh, I was looking at the container. That's why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, I was typing, but at the same time, basically, I saw this as, as you know, I saw in the corner of my eye, this change. But then, of course, um, I need to, uh, once I actually set it, then it will be, you know. Uh, oh, yes. You have to have all three there before it's going to show up and render anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not the service. Um, and then I, this is again RGB uh, zero, uh, zero, two, four, five. Cool. So now we have RGB colors. So while the red and blue markers look the same, the green one is much lighter than it was before. This is because the green color keyword is actually a darker shade and is about halfway between black and the maximum value for green. In the dot two CSS rule, set the green value in RGB function to 127 to lower it its intensity. So we shall do that. Cool. So far, so good. Now add a little more vertical space. Uh, between your markers and the edge of the container element they're in. In the container CSS rule, use the shorthand padding property to add 10 pixel of top and bottom padding and set the left and right padding to zero. This works similar, similarly to the shorthand margin property used earlier. So, so they want me to, in the container rule, to use the word padding and then add 10 pixel of top and bottom pattern. Remember when we have the two in the shorthand, the first one is for your top and bottom. The second one is for your left and right for shorthand. Trying to remember that actually. Um, what, do I just write 10 and 10, then? 10 pixel, you need the PX, you need the units. And then uh, space, and you need uh, you need it in quotes. Well, actually, you know, I don't know if you need it in quotes. You don't need it in quotes. I can try to change it in quotes. Let's see what happens. Uh, nothing changes. Yeah. If bit quotes. I'm actually thinking of something else. Yeah. Actually, hold on. Let me see if. Yeah, yeah. If if you put it in quotes, it's like that. But if you have, uh, if you remove quotes, it's like yeah. that. 
yeah, that's what you need. Semicolon at the end, but yeah. it lets you get away with that. Yeah. In the additive RGB color model, uh, primary colors are colors that, when combined, create pure white. But for this to happen, each color needs to be at its highest intensity. B before you can combine colors, set your green marker back to pure green for the RGB function in a dot two CSS rule, set green green back to the max value of 255. So we will need to set the green to 255. Right, now that you have the primary RGB colors, it's time to combine them. For the RGB function in the dot container rule, set the red, green, and blue values to the max of 255. So we are going to set everything to 255. Okay, so secondary colors are the colors you you get when you combine primary colors. You might have noticed some secondary colors in the last step as you change the red, green, and blue values. To create the first secondary color, yellow, update the RGB function in the dot uh, one CSS rule to combine pure red and pure green. So basically, like that. Because basically, yeah, they want you to do max. So, okay, to create the next secondary color, cyan, update the RGB function in the dot CSS rule to combine a pure green and pure blue. So, we need to just do that. And there you go. Uh, to create the final secondary color, magenta, update the RGB function in it free CSS rule to combine pure blue and pure red. So pure blue and pure red will be here. Perfect. And now that you're familiar with the secondary colors, you'll learn how to create tertiary colors. Tertiary colors are created by combining a primary uh, with a nearby secondary color. To create tertiary color orange, update the RGB function in a dot one CSS rule so that the red is at max value and set the green to 127. There we are. All quite straightforward. No notice that to create orange, you had to increase the intensity of red and decrease the intensity of the green RGB values. This is because orange is a combination of red and yellow and falls between the two colors on the color wheel. To create the tertiary color spring green, combine cyan with green. Update the RGB function uh, in the two CSS rule so that green is a max value and blue is a 127. Okay. Uh, let's go. And to create the tertiary color violet, combine magenta with blue. Um, update uh, the RGB function in a dot three as CSS rule so that blue is a max value and set red to one to seven. So all of this, do you remember this stuff by heart, Connie? Or oh no. Remember? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's all I'm trying to say. So this is just getting me to like keep going and you know put it into the head but honestly i don't i doubt uh, anybody will remember any of this no, the, the important thing to remember here is is um how the the rgb function itself and it's red excuse me yeah red green and blue and that by combining any of those numbers together you can get all kinds of different colors um and there will be something other else that we'll be learning on layering on top of this here very soon that um will just add on to this and make more sense as we go forward. It's just one way of defining the color in your CSS or your styles. Sounds good. Uh, okay, so there are three more tertiary colors, chart, reuse green, green and yellow, azure, blue and cyan, and rose, red and magenta. 
to create chart, reuse green, uh, update the RGB function in the dot once rule so that red is 127 and green is 255. I'm just going to do this uh, as I go. Mm -hmm. So red is um, 127 and uh, green is at max value. Okay, uh, for Azure, now I'm a big Azure guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> You'll recognize this color when you see it. My, this is my kind of world, but yeah. Um, let me see. For Azure, update the RGB function in a dot two rule so that green is at 27 and blue is a max value. So we just need to flip them and there we are. There's there Azure. Is. And then the three uh, and for rows, which is sometimes called bright pink, update RGB function so that blue is one two seven and red is a max value. So again, just flipping them. Good job. Yeah. Now that you've gone through all the primary, secondary, tertiary colors on the color wheel, it will be easier to understand other color theory concepts and how they impact design. First, in the rules 1, 2, and 3, address the values in the RGB function so that the background color of each element is set to pure black. Remember that the RGB function uses the additive color model, which Colors where well, colors start as black and change the va as values of red, green, and blue increase. So, so, so they want me to set it to zero. Is that right? Yeah, pure black. Yeah, because it's an additive way of doing things, meaning you start with zero and you add numbers to get your colors. That's why it's an additive way of doing it. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Zero. And then zero. There we are. Um, okay, a color wheel is a circle where similar colors or hues are next to each other and different ones are further apart. For example, pure red is between the hues rose and orange. Two colors that are opposite from each other on a color wheel are called complementary colors. If two complementary colors are combined, they produce gray. But when they're placed side by side, these colors produce strong visual contrasts and appear brighter. In the RGB function for the dot one CSS rule, set the red value to the max of 255 to produce pure red. And in the RGB function, so basically kind of what we did before. Uh, Uh, so, so they want me to produce some. Okay, so notice that the red and cyan colors are very bright right next to each other. Uh, the, this contrast can be distracting if it's overused on a website and can make text hard to read if it's placed on a complementary colored background. It's better practice to choose one color as the dominant color and use its con complementary color as an accent to bring attention to certain content on a page. First, in the H1 rule, use the RGB function to set its background color to cyan. So let's just, uh, so they want me to do this. And then RGB, oh wait, uh, what am I doing, background color. RGB and then okay. Uh, what did we have a sign? This is there we are. That sign two zero two four five. Uh, okay, brilliant. So we have this now. Next in there, don't want. 
rule use the RGB function to set the background color to black. And in the 2.2 rule, use the RGB function to set the background color to red. So in this one, we need to do um, to black. So that means we need to do zero. And then in a dot two rule, use RGB function to set the background color to red. So we need to do that. Lots of maths here. You're <laughs> yeah. actually learning quite a bit here, whether you know it or not. You're getting this. Uh, you you know how to do several colors now at this point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, maybe it'll just be ingrained into my memory now. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I want. Uh, 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 if I need to think of sign, it's zero two five five, and you know it's quite a few. Um, right. So notice how your eyes are naturally drawn to the red color in the center. When designing a site, you can use this effect to draw attention to important headings, buttons, or links. There are several other important color combinations outside of complementary colors, but you'll learn those a bit later. For now, use the RGB function in dot two rule set to uh, set the background color to black. So here's a question, Connie. So uh, out of like you know sites you've seen and stuff like that, um, is uh, is most practice to mainly use these colors or like you know, as they said, secondary, tertiary. You can obviously get any color you want, right? But what is a better practice in terms of, you know, using colors wherever you should stick to a certain model or you should uh, actually be, um, you know, uh, like uh, whatever basically the company wants, really? <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of there's a color theory. Um, like I have some I know some folks who are in design school and it is a very important uh, subject to get right, because a lot of people associate certain, first of all, certain emotions to certain colors. Uh, and you want to pick the colors that will um, convey the idea, the thought or the aura or the brand that you want. Some colors are like subconsciously associated with certain things in life and in different cultures. So it really depends on your audience. You want to pick the right colors to convey your message as best as possible. And then there's also not just that, but there's also um, accessibility with colors. Some people with color blindness have certain different kinds of color blindness. So you have to bring that into the picture. So whenever I'm designing anything that that involves colors, which a lot of things do like on front end, whenever I'm doing front end development, I usually consult with someone who know who knows a lot more or I do some lot of lot of research online to make sure that the colors I'm picking uh, work uh, work the way I intend them to do or convey the, the message that I want them to. So there's a lot to color theory. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I kind of have been looking because for my for my YouTube, I uh, look at different like, um, you know, where you need to create different thumbnails and you, you might need a different, um, you know, color combinations in order to, you know, get attention and everything like that. So, yeah, I can see definitely that's uh, something that, to think about when it comes to that. Yeah. And um, we have uh, also, Constantine says, uh, the Azure cost management graphs and his kind of blindness. Uh, being, uh, of those, yeah. yeah, okay. I didn't yeah, know yeah. that. You have, yeah, you, you have like, um, there's a thing because uh, some uh, people who may have be, um, you know, really, color blind so there's a there's like ways and options you can set the accessibility i think some websites do um you know an alternative but yeah i don't think all of that's them do. yeah that's a good question kaminsky maybe we could ask you to reply here real quick if you know is there a browser setting i'm not aware of uh, browsers that will kind of uh manage that for you is that a thing I, th I think there is. I think there are some add-ons as well that you can actually Probably. Use. I would uh, think so because they could read the computer. They can read your CSS um, just like any website could. It, yeah, exactly. So it's just like it's just converting certain colors into a different um, kind of format. as you. If there uh, isn't, there should be, right? 
Yeah, exactly. If, if it's you not know, designed, then maybe you, that'd you be a great to... project. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe we could do that if there is. I'm pretty sure it would work though. Well. But yeah. yeah. Um, uh, okay. Cool. All right. So let's go on to the next one. Anyway, um, uh, where are we now? We are on step forty, and yeah, you know, well, we're doing okay on time, I think. So yeah. in and in the H1 rule, remove the background color property to end value to go back to the default white color. So what we need to do is we need to go and remove this and push, push this back to the default white color. Uh, hold on one sec. Uh, and to go back to the, oh, remove the off. It doesn't want an actual. It just wants it to. Oh, okay. Uh, now it's time to add the other details in the markers, starting with the first one. In the first marker div element, change the class one to red. So, done. Update the one dot one class selector to target the red class. So we need to update this dot one to red and then that's it i know they're going to change it to 255 but i was getting ahead of myself and update the rgb function in our dot red rule so that's the red yeah there we are uh yeah and then next change the clause two to green in the second mark i, I think i know what's going on here so i'm just gonna quickly do this red green blue right so uh, yeah Oh, wait, hold on, Mark. Yep. Uh, they actually want you to do the other two, both of them. Oh, yeah, yeah the one the, in one go. Okay, cool. Blue. And then update the CSS class selector to dot two, yeah, to green. And then uh, update, so it updates blue. And then they're going to get me to change the color. You think so? Uh, Oh, then I, yeah, just one. And then, uh, so, okay, cool. So we, we've done with that um, quick um, color change. Uh, so now you may already be familiar with decimal or base 10 values, which go from 0 to 9. Hexadecimal or base 16 values go from 0 to 9 and then uh, A to F. Uh, with hex colors, uh, 0, 0 is 0% 0 of that color, and FF is 100%. So hashtag 0, 0, FF 0, 0 translates to, ah, okay. Uh, you know what? I've always seen it, but I never actually understood how or why it works like that. But it's good to know. Uh, Yay, finally. After all these years. Exactly. Yeah, no. <laughs> I've, I've, I've always seen that. Oh, what, the, what does that mean? Hash zero zero F F zero zero. But like, yeah, now I now I kind of get it. Why it's like that. That's why um, it's important to go back and learn basics of things to fill in the little holes and the gaps in the knowledge that we kind of gather as we're learning. We don't know what those little holes and the gaps are. Nice to understand. Yeah, I mean, I've I've uh, I had to inspect a few websites in my time, especially like because of uh, our uh, you know coding and being in a cloud and everything like that. Yeah. And uh, they, it's just like you know, I see that, but I never actually understood you know why it, it is what it is. But now I just I know the meaning behind it. Okay, so lower the intensity of green by setting the green value of the hex color. To seven F. Okay, so so like that. Right. So that essentially. Okay. Uh, so the HSL color model or huge saturation and lightness is another way to represent colors. The CSS HSL function accepts three values: a number from zero to three sixty for hue, a percentage from zero to one hundred for saturation, and a percentage from zero to one hundred for lightness. If you imagine a color wheel, the hue red is at zero degrees, green is at one twenty degrees, and blue is at two forty degrees. Saturation is the intensity of a color from zero percent or gray to one hundred percent for pure color. Lightness is how bright a 
color appears from 0% of complete black to 100% complete white and with 50% being neutral. Uh, uh, okay, uh, it's all losing me, but I will carry on. <laughs> In the CSS <laughs> rule, use the HSL function to change the background color property to pure blue, set the hue to 240, the saturation to 100%, and the lightness to 50%. Okay, so so what we need to do is in a dot blue CSS rule, use the HSL function. So we need to what? So right now you have you're using RGB in your background color. And so instead of RGB, you want to leave background color because we're just going to change the way that we're going to calculate background color. We're going to use HSL function. And instead of our GB, those three values, you now have hue, saturation, and lightness. Saturation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so they want me to set the hue to 240, set the saturation to be 100. And, and that's a percent, so you actually do need the units on that to be percent. Right. Yep. And there you go. Oh, it's not 240%. It's just 240 on that one. All that right. one is just a number. Yes. Right. So there you go. Points. Okay. So yeah. wait a minute. That's uh, just going to mess around quickly. Yeah. That's great. You should always yeah, see what happens when I do this. What happens if I do that? Maybe I'm just being colorblind, but I don't see any difference if you set the saturation to be like even 10%. Okay, you don't now, see a difference. There you go. Yeah. Like when I had a 50%, I couldn't really see a difference. 100. Not much. Yeah. There's a little bit of a difference. Sometimes your monitor too can uh, doesn't really display colors uh, as well or as cleanly or crisply, uh, yeah, or different, yeah. you know, you have you can look at something on one monitor and it looks different than looking at it on a different monitor, so to speak. Uh, you've learned a few ways to set flat col colors in CSS, but you can also use a color transition or gradient on an element. Uh, a gradient is when one color transitions into another. The CSS linear gra gradient let function lets you control the direction of the transition along a line and which colors are used. One thing to remember is that the linear gradient function actually creates an image element and is usually paired with a background property which can accept an image as a value. In the dot red CSS rule, change the background color property to background. Uh, okay, so we're just going to change this to, oh wait, no, hold on, what am I doing? It just wants me to change it to background. Yes. Uh, no, so I'm just quickly rereading myself. Um, right, so we're going to be creating a linear gradient. Okay. Yes. So, so when you're when you're setting the background property, it takes an image. Uh, yeah. Yes, and so since linear gradient produces an image, you can use that to set the background of uh, your element. Well, what do you usually see? Is it mostly a combinate? Because we've just been going through about like six or seven different types, right? But like what I'm wondering is like, uh, what do you usually see? Is it mainly RGB? Is it HSL? Or is it all, you know, whichever? Usually I, I have, in personal experience, I've just used more, I use a lot more color than image background. Ooh. But if, if uh, sometimes if you need a pattern, or an effect like a gradient, a gradient, you know, we're gonna learn here about gradients in just a moment where we go from one color and then uh, fade into uh, one or more other colors. Um, that's actually produces an image for us and, or an image like a, something that's like a wallpaper of sorts, or you want some kind of a picture type of background, then those are images you don't usually need as many of those uh, just because usually one page will have 
very have f fewer images on it than different colors. So that's just been my experience. So we said that and set it for Ali to be all right. Okay, so yes, yeah, so far, um, that is going to be your gradient direction, 90 degrees. Um, but you also then need, or what are they asking you to put in here? Uh, uh, cold passes, but I'm guessing on the next. Um, okay, yeah, will... we're going to put the rest of it in next. Yeah. So you'll use the uh, RGB function for the colors of this gradient. In the linear gradient function, use the RGB function to set the first color argument to pure red. So, so what we need to do is use it to set the. So you want to we'll, set your uh, separate your arguments with commas, and we're going to put it pass in another argument. So a space, we're passing in a color. And you know different ways to, to specify colors now. You can use the word red, but they don't want you to use the word red. They want you to specify red with RGB function. Remember how to do that? Mm -hmm. I think so. I've got... Uh, so All zero. red, no green, yep. So. No blue. There you go. Uh, did that work? No. The, the I think you might have an extra um, closing... Parenthesis, maybe. Ooh. Oh, you have an opening parenthesis. You don't need an opening parenthesis. All right, okay. Because, yeah. Yeah, because when, when you get the first bit, I was just like, oh, you, you nest within, an, you know, within that, but I guess you don't. <laughs> so. That's fine. Um, so that should hopefully... that should do it. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have two arguments in there. Your your ninety degrees and yeah. your color so far. Yeah. Okay. You won't see gradient yet because uh, linear gradient function needs at least two color arguments to work. In the same linear gradient function, use the RGB function to set the color argument to pure green. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be in Wait, not there. No. And I think you read it so quickly. You kind of, um, if, if you're a, an audible listener, you, what you heard yourself say, you heard yourself, you didn't use, you didn't say the word second color. And so you missed that when you went over. Now I'm only pointing this out for people, for us who are, when we're learning something, Take your time to read it, even though you want to hurry up and read it, read it quickly. When you read it slowly and you're hearing what you're saying, you're going to understand it a lot better. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, what I'm doing here is like it's uh, it can be quite uh, difficult because I'm trying to live stream and <laughs> also and do, like, yes, so yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's just one of those that it does take that. So. In the same same linear gradient, use the RGB function. So we need to also add to set the second color argument to pure. So when they mean that, do they mean? What, this no, you want to keep that red just as it is. Uh, so and then we're going to add another color argument after this. Yes. So comma RGB, Correct. and then to. Two five five. Sorry, zero two five five, and then zero. Right there, you go. Cool. Right. So there we go. If are. it would help, you can read it like you're right, like you're teaching me. Like um, I, I am not reading it, and so you are telling it to me. That way, you have to be very clear about what you're reading. Mm -hmm. Because there are some, I remember when we started this, we were like, if some stu some students who are people who are going through this with us and they don't read, uh, they don't like reading, um, then your reading it out loud helps them because they're going to hear it. And so you want to be very clear to get every single word because it's in, the words are important. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, right. So we're so far so good. Uh, uh, so step 53, as you can see, the linear gradient function produces a smooth red-green gradient. While the linear gradient function needs a minimum of two color arguments to work, it can accept many color arguments. Use the RGB function to add pure blue, 
to the third kind of uh, argument to the linear gradient function. So they want me to add a third one, which is going to be RGB, and then it will be uh, 0, 0, and then 255. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I do like the look of that more than any other look. So, yeah, that's mm -hmm. pretty good. Um, kind of stops uh, allow you to fine tune where colors are placed along the gradient line. The length unit like pixel or percentages that follow a color in a linear gradient function. So for example, in this red black gradient, the transition from red to black takes place at the 90% point along the gradient line. So red takes up most of the available space. In a linear gradient function, uh, add a 75% color stop after the first red color argument. Do not add the color stops to the other color arguments. So what they're saying is that I have a linear gradient. I have a RGB, uh, for example. So add a center after the first red color argument. So this is the first color argument. So if we do a 75%. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Yep. What they're saying here is along this element that has this linear gradient goes 75% in that first color across it. And so you see how it extended the red in our uh, preview. So if you have 75% on each, does that also equate to that's an interesting test yeah because i was like interesting uh looks like it skipped the green altogether what if i did sorry i do um percent cool. <laughs> and then oh sorry no if i did 75 percent for this one uh i guess it doesn't and i did 150 percent for this one yeah, it just goes all the way to the right, right? So mm -hmm. it's essentially, that's what... Um, okay, cool, right. Uh, let me just now correct my code, so it's <laughs> all good. <laughs> right, that's going be fine. Perfect. Let's go to the next one. Um, now that you know the basics of how the linear gradient function and the color stops work, you can use them to make the markers look more realistic. In a linear gradient function, set gradient direction to 180 degrees. So we have uh, currently a 90 degrees, so they want me to swap it to 180. And then... You see what that did? Instead of going across, we're, we're up and down now. Yep, we went. I uh, see. So, uh, sorry, uh, let's just, um, what does 360 do? Uh, oh, yeah, I see. I see how it is. Okay, cool. So if I did uh, 270, yeah, that will flip it. Okay, cool. Do like um, some off number, like 25 or 20, not 25, 28 or something. See how it's it's kind of in a circle like that as to where the gradient's working. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. Uh, 118. Nice. Right. Uh, so we need 180. Yep, that's fine. Um, next, set the color stop for red to 0%, the color stop for green to 50%, and the color stop for blue to 100%. So they want me to set the color stop to be 0 uh green is 50 percent and blue is 100 percent you can close the preview if it's sometimes when these are getting long in this in this particular unit you can close the preview and then see what you're doing a little better and then it'll open it. yeah scooch it yep there you go uh. Okay, cool. Nice. Right. 
my prep classes, so let's go into the next one. Step 57. Um, now that the color stops are set, you apply different shades of red to each color argument uh, in a linear gradient function. The shades on the top and the bottom edges of the marker will be darker, while the one in the middle will be lighter, as if there's a light above it. For the first color argument, which is currently pure red, update the RGB function so the value for red is 1 to 2, the value for green is 74, and the value for blue is 14. So for the first, the, so they want me to basically update the RGB values. So the RGB values will be 1, 2, 2, um, 74, and 14. Okay. Cool. Next one. Now modify the second color argument in a linear gradient function, which is currently pure green. Update the RGB function, so the value for red is 2 equal 5, value of green 62, and value of blue is 113. So let's see how we do on this one. So we will push out uh, red. Um, Green is 62 and blue is 113. Yeah, perfect. Uh, step 59, finally modify the third color argument in a linear gradient function, which is currently pure blue. Update the RGB function so the value for red is 162, the value of green is 27, and the value of blue is 27. So again, the third color argument they want me to update to be uh, 162, 27 and 27. Cool. Nice. Uh, the red marker is looking much more realistic. Now you do the same for the green marker. Using a combination for of the linear gradient uh, functions and hex colors. In the green, dot green CSS rule, change the background color property to background. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to change this to background. And we'll go to the next one. For, the, for this marker, you'll use hex color codes for your gradient. Uh, use the linear gradient function and set gradient direction to 180 degrees. And for the first color argument, uh, use a hex color code with the values 55 for red, 60 for green, and 0D for blue. So what we're gonna be doing, uh, so getting rid of this uh, linear, Gradient and um, oh no, sorry, I'm just gonna do it this way so I don't forget how it look, may look. Uh, so we're gonna do linear gradient, and we're gonna do uh, here 180 deg, and then it's gonna be uh, 55. 68 and 70. The, this is for the first color argument. And they're telling you to use a hex way yeah. of getting at the uh, getting at the color. Yes, I see. So hold on. I need to do um then so I got this and then uh was was hex. How do you call it? Uh, is it hex? Hashtag. Yeah. Oh yeah, hash. Let's see, so hashtag. Ah, ah, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. I get it now. Let's get rid of this and let's get rid there of it. There you that. go. Yeah. So that's kind of what I wanted. Awesome. So now, um, but the reason why we're not seeing anything is because we only have one color specified. As soon as we put another color on it, it'll know where to go. So that's why it doesn't know where to go. Uh -huh. 
For the second color argument, uh, use a hex color code with a value 71 for red, uh, F5 for green, and 3U for blue. So again, we're going to just do uh, comma, and then hashtag uh, 71, 5, 3. OK. Awesome. Doing a great job, Andre. <laughs> Yeah. Looks like we're gonna make it too. So keep yeah. Keep trying. You want to take over reading my? Um, oh, I'd be happy to read anytime. Okay, I can read. Step sixty-three. Mm -hmm. That's looking better, but the bottom edge of the green marker needs to be darker to add a little more dimension. See how it's a little light right now. In the same linear gradient function, add a hex color code with the values eleven for red. 6C for green, 31 for blue as the third color argument. So we're going to add a third color argument, hex 11, 63, excuse me, 6C and 31. Yes. Awesome. Step cool. 64. Even without the color steps, you might have noticed that the colors for the green marker transition at the same points as the red marker. The first color starts at zero, the second is in the middle at 50%, and the last at the end at 100% of the gradient line. The linear gradient function automatically calculates these values for you and places colors evenly along the gradient line by default. So what it says is it automatically does that for you. In the dot red color CSS rule, remove the three color stops that you have in there from the linear gradient function to clean up your code a bit because it's automatically doing that for you. So you can just remove those color stops. Cool, yep. So that's what we'll do. We'll go here, remove that, remove this. Yep. Remove um, this. Yep. Very good. Okay, you want me to keep reading? Yeah, go for it. Okay, step 65. If no gradient direction argument is provided to the linear gradient function, it arranges colors from top to bottom or along a 180 degree line by default. So what it's saying is that your default DEG is 180. Clean up your code a little more by removing the gradient direction argument from both linear gradient functions. So just remove that argument altogether, including that comma. Yeah. So basically, when you want to do a linear gradient, you need to tell it what color to what color. By default, it's going to do 180, and it's going to do those particular color stops, unless you tell it otherwise. Nice. Cool. Step 66. Now you'll apply a gradient to the blue marker. This time using the HSL function as your color arguments. So we're going to do the same kind of thing. First one we used RGB for colors. Second one we used hex for colors. This one we're going to use the HSL function. So in the blue class CSS rule, change the background color property to background because remember it needs uh, an image and our color gradient produces an image. Cool. Test good. Step 67. Use the linear gradient function and pass in the HSL function with the values 186 for hue, 70, yep, 76% for saturation, yep, and 16% for lightness. Nice. Uh, Is that it? That should be it. Test what's it say? The blue CSS uh, rule should have a background property. Uh, I haven't typed in the linear gradient. That's why. That is why. Good, good catch. And uh, we need to close it off. That's it. Good job. Step 68, as the second color argument pass in the HSL function with the values, so we need a second color argument. HSL function, first argument is uh, 223 for hue, 90% for saturation, and 60% for lightness. Nice. 
Okay, step 69. As the third color argument, third color argument, mm -hmm. yep, is HSL function with the values 240. Oh, so we want to separate with a comma. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or, you know. There you go. 56% um, for saturation and 42% for lightness. Yep. Nice. That's cool. So I can take over again. Uh, I've let you for 10, 10, 10 or something like that. So I'll try. Yeah. Um, now that the markers have the correct colors, the Santibo, the marker sleeves, start with the red marker. Inside the red marker div, create a new div and give it a class of sleeve. So let's just, uh, we're, so we're going to, inside the red marker div, we're going to create a new one. And we're going to do class, and then we're going to do a sleeve. And then we need to close that, and we also need to close that. Nice. All right, so create a new CSS rule that targets a class sleeve. So in order to do classes, we need to do a full stop. Then we Good. need to do sleeve. Then we need to do like that, uh, space, and then enter. And then we need to do uh, set the width uh, to be 110 pixel. And set the height to be 25. Uh, why do I set the Try putting a semicolon after your 110. I don't know if that's what's throwing it off. Probably but. is, yeah. Well, I need to get into that habit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it's like it's not telling me, so I'm like, uh, I'm fine. Especially if you're a Python developer, you're not in a habit of using semicolons. So, yeah. So to make the marker look more real realistic, give the sleeve a transparent white color. Uh, first set the sleeve elements background color to white. Uh, so first of all, we need to set the sleeve background color to white. So we will do that. We'll just add in the background color. And then we'll do white. Uh, so first elements. Oh, right. Yeah, that's why. That's, yes, yes, yes. There you huh. go. Sometimes it like lets you get away with it, and sometimes it doesn't. But yeah. and, and if it's a final one, it lets you get away with it. But if you have code uh, underneath that, then it won't. I think you're right. I think that is how it's working. So opacity describes how opaque or non-transparent something is. For example, a solid wall is opaque and no light can pass through. But a drinking glass is much more transparent and you can see through the glass to the other side. With the CSS opacity property, you can control how opaque or transparent an element is. With the value 0, 0%, 0 the element will be completely transparent. And at 1.0 or 100%, the element will be completely opaque, like it is by default. In the .sleeve CSS rule, set the opacity property to 0 0.5. So I'm just going to set the opacity property to be 0 0.5. Check your code. Brilliant. So that works. And now, um, in, so another way to set the opacity for an element is with the alpha channel. Similar to the opacity property, the alpha channel controls how transparent or opaque a color is. You've already set the sleeve's opacity with a name color and the opacity property, but you can add an alpha channel to the other CSS color properties. Inside the dot sleeve rule, remove the opacity property and its value. Okay, so we're, we're going to be using alpha, so we remove this. Um, so now you're already familiar with using RGB function to set colors. To add an alpha channel to an RGB color, use the RGBA function instead. 
the RGBA function works just like the RGB function, but takes one more number from 0 to 1.0 for the alpha channel. So uh, in this dust, dot sleeve rule, use the RGBA function to set the background color property to pure white with 50% opacity. So in the dot sleeve rule, use the RGBA function to set the background color. So what we need to do is get rid of white, do RGBA, and then uh, if we look at this example, red value, and then it will have an alpha value at the end. So Right, so then it will be, what did I need? Uh, uh, to pure white. So if pure white is 255.255, .255, th this is me in networking. If I think of 255, it's networking. <laughs> uh, thing for me, it's like, yeah, dot two five five dot that one. Yeah, think of a think of all networks are white. Uh, you know, your 255, what is that? Is that your, um, yeah. Yeah, all networks are whitelisted. I don't think a lot of people are <laughs> happy with that. <laughs> right, anyway. Um, so, and then we'll set the opacity to be 50%. Good. And I want to mention something about this particular reading that you did. It was excellent. Your enunciation was really great. Uh, and I think that helped you to really understand what was going on. Like when you got to the part of actually doing the exercise, you really knew what was going on because your enunciation was good and your, your internal learner kind of picked up on that and went right along with it. So, you know, great job on that. Yeah, I, th I think it also depends on the subject. I mean, this this subject was kind of um, a more of a, a, you know, I understand that one, but like when it when it's introducing there's something a little bit new that you haven't heard of and in quite a few lines, then it might be a little bit, you know, you're just trying to process all of that thing for, going mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. So let's see. So that's fine. We are happy to go into the next one. Step 76, your sleeve is looking good, but it would look even better if it was positioned more towards the right side of the marker. One way to do that is to add another element before the sleeve to push it to the right. Add a new div with the class cap before the sleeve div element. So we need to, um, before, so we have this one. So we need to add a new one which is going to be uh, class equals cap, uh, class off, we're going to do that, div, okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I keep doing this, but in these examples, they leave it like this. Uh, sorry, um, what I mean is they put div over here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. okay. It depends on if you have something in between that they a lot of times like to have it top, bottom, and whatever is in between indented for readability. Uh, so create a new CSS rule to target the class cap in a new rule set the width property. Okay, so we're gonna, we need to create a new CSS rule called cap. And we need to do this. Then we need to do uh, width to be uh, 60 pixel and the height to be uh, 25 pixel. Uh, yes, this is me and this is me learning how to. <laughs> right, okay, there we go. Um, so it looks like your sleeve disappeared, but don't worry, it's still there. What happened is that your new captive is taking up the entire width of the marker and is pushing the sleeve down to the next line. This is because the default display property for div elements is a block. So when two block elements are next to each other, they stack like actual blocks. For example, your marker elements are all stacked on top of each other. To position two div elements on the same line, set the display properties to an inline block. Create a new rule to target both the cap and the Steve classes and set display to inline block. Now, if I remember correctly, I do dot cap and then is it comma and, and then is it sleeve? Is it like this? Uh, close. Your sleeve is also a class. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I was like wondering, is it is it recognizing that? But that yeah, that wouldn't make sense. That it would recognize both of them at the same time. So I was just like, yeah, that's fine. Um, yep. Right, and Good then job. so. 
display to be an inline block, right? Yes. And then I'm perfect. So yep. sub 79, in the last project, you learned a little bit about borders and border color property. All HTML elements have borders while well, they usually set to none by default. With CSS, you can control all aspects of an element's border and set the border on all sides or just one side at a time. For a border to be visible, you need to set its width and style. In the dot sleeve CSS rule, add the border left width property with a value 10 pixels. So we are going to uh, add border left width. And then we're going to do 10 pixel. Perfect. Um, so borders have several styles to choose from. You can make your border a solid line, but you can also use a dashed or dotted line if you prefer. Solid border lines are probably the most common. In the dot Steve CSS rule, add the border left style property with the value solid. So we are doing that, and then they want uh, the border left um, style to be uh, solid. Uh, yes. Cool. So your border should be visible now. Uh, if you um, if you no color is set, black is used by default, but to make your code more readable, it's better to set the border color explicitly. In the sleeve CSS rule, add the border left color property with the value black. So border left color, so we need to add that one. Cool, so that's fine. So the border left shorthand property lets you uh, lets you to set the left borders width style and color at the same time. So uh, I'm just saying I've got like these borders and this is what it's all doing, right? It's like it's giving me this and it's giving me a border of 10 pixels and then it's here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so... Here's the syntax. In this leave CSS rule, to replace a border left width, um, border left cell, and border left color properties with a border left shorthand property. The value for the width cell and color of the left border should be the same. So, where are we going? In it? Let's see CSS rule replace. Uh, so, we need to replace these three with the border left hand short property so i would uh, not delete them yet because you need the values because it's telling you to use the same values just right underneath that right underneath it add border left oh yeah so or you could you could use the first one you know just keep uh, your replace. values yeah yeah so they they just want to replace it with like this right so essentially if we they want one, like a shorthand, like we had margin and padding shorthands for top, right, bottom, left. You can use a shorthand. You can use a shorthand for border left as well because we're specifying three different things for your border left property. We're specifying the width, the style, and the color all for border left. So what they're saying is you can just use border left and give all three of those properties values on the one line like that. And you, you don't need to separate them with a comma. There's no commas. Yes, okay. exactly. Um, no commas. Yep. That's it. Yep. Your marker is looking good, but to make it look even more realistic, you can change the border style to double solid borders. So for the border left shorthand property, change the border style value from solid to double. So from the border left, we need to change it from solid to double. Okay. Right, so that changed from solid to double here. 
So the black color of your border looks pretty harsh against a more transparent sleeve. Uh, you can use an alpha channel to lower the opacity of the black border. So for the border left shorthand property, use the RGBA function to set the color value to pure black with 75% opacity. So we need to do RGBA, do that. So zero, zero, uh, zero, uh, zero, and then we need to also do 75%. And that should hopefully do it. Nice. Yeah. So awesome, your red marker is looking good. Now all you need to do is add the caps and sleeves to your other markers. Uh, add a cap and sleeve to both the green and blue markers. You can just copy the div elements from the red marker and paste them into the other two markers. So how are we gonna do this? Uh, add to both the green and blue markers. So they want me to, yeah, so they want me to basically copy and paste. They're actually telling me to copy and paste in this one. Yeah, so imagine that. I'll do that. <laughs> with gladness, but, he says. <laughs> hey, I'm just going with what the course says. But yeah, I mean, it's just like uh, they sometimes want. Uh, let's see. Right. right. And um, so now we have all. Looks good. Good. So the last thing you'll do is add a slight shadow to each marker to make them look even more realistic. The box shadow property lets you apply one or more shadows around an element. Here's a basic syntax. So box shadow offset x, y offset, y and color. So by adding a simple shadow to the red marker, in the red dot red CSS rule, add the box shadow property with the values five pixel. So let's see. So we need to go into in the red CSS rule, um, uh, which is this one. Oh, Actually, wait. it's the whole the the CSS rule itself. You want to add another rule. Right, so after yeah. background or before it, either one. Yeah. I was thinking of um, the colors more than. Uh, yeah. So add box shadow. And Andre, you have a little dash at the end of your background rule. There oh, you yeah. go. I don't know if you've seen that. Box shadow, and then that will be uh, offset X, which is uh, offset X five pixel. You actually don't have to name those values. Just going to put the values in there. So it will be All like. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I read it this way, but I didn't see. And there they highlighted again, like it's that, like they did before with the class thing we were originally talking about. So it's confusing. I'm right. Red. So that should be it. Yeah. Let's do that. Oh, wait. Is that why that's it? Oh, because you have commas. There's no commas. Yep. Right. As you can see, you added a simple red shadow around your marker. That's five pixels to the right and five pixels down. But what if you wanted to position your shadow on the opposite side? You can do that by using negative values for offset X and offset Y. Updated values for the box shadow property and offset X to minus five pixels and offset Y to minus five pixels. So they just want me to add a negative. So let's see what's happening over here. So I see my box shadow to be like this. Okay, cool. And that passes. Notice that the edges of the shadow sh are sharp. This is because there is an optional blue blur radius value for the box shadow property. Uh, yeah, box shadow offset X offset Y bl blur radius color. So if a blur radius value isn't included, it defaults to zero and produces sharp edges. The higher the value of the blur radius, the greater the blurring effect is. In the green CSS rule, add the box shadow property. So we need to add again, but we need to this time around set five pixel, 
pixel and five pixel for the blur radius and then it will be green for the um, remember that when you're doing the shorthand um that there's no commas yeah so i i am so, the, the thing is i've coded in many different languages before yeah. so for me co putting commas is automatic so it's like i hear yeah. you. I, I i agree it's very yeah it it's just a matter what language you're dealing with yeah exactly um but what if you wanted to expand this uh, expand the shadow out further you can do that if you with the optional spread radius value um box shadow offset x offset y blur radius spread radius and color so like blur radius spread radius defaults to zero if it is included practice by adding a five pixel shadow directly around the blue marker so we need to in the blue we need to add the box shadow okay cool so we need to add a new box shadow and we need to do uh zero 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 five blue okay i think that's it yep that's done so it looks like it's in circles like almost a border you know but it's in circles that cool yep and now step 90 now that you're familiar with the box shadow property you can finalize the shadows starting with the one for the red marker in the dot red css rule update the values for the box shadow property so offset x is zero uh, so they want me everything is zero except blur radius and red so we will zero <laughs> 20 pixel um, zero and red okay cool so there we are that's done um so sub 91 next update the color value of the red markers box shadow property uh, replace the name color with the rgba function use the values 83 for red 14 for green 14 for blue and 0 0.8 for the alpha channel so what do we next of the red markers box shadow property so what they want is instead of using red i use rgba and then i do Eighty-three for a red. Can we yeah, yeah. these off to you? Eighty-three. No, it's fine. I'm just um, thinking why it's uh, uh, and then zero point eight. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Like, because uh, I, I, I tr like the way I got confused was yeah, I'm doing the color, but then uh, the the zeros over here, I was just yeah. like. Get going confused with that. That was just like, uh, yeah, that's yeah. a lot of stuff going on in that rule. Yeah, because yeah, they're all like pixels, right? And they're not there's because it's like it's zero, not zero pixel. That's a know? good point. Whenever you have zero, zero pixels, you don't you can drop the units. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But when you're trying to learn, you the understand it, sometimes can go. It didn't tell you that, did it? I mean, it didn't explicitly put that in the text anywhere maybe if you have a zero did, pixel. Maybe it did in the previous modules three it? weeks ago, but... Uh, okay, I don't remember it saying that. The, sh the shadows for your green and blue markers will have the same position, blur and spread. The only difference be will be the colors. In the dot green and dot blue CSS rules, update the values for the box shadow properties. So offset X is zero, so they won't... Okay, so for the box shadow properties, they essentially want zero, zero, uh, 20 pixel, and spread radius to zero. Again, same thing over here, except 20 pixel and zero. Okay, looking good. So for the green markers box shadow property, replace the name color with a hex color code. These are values, um, so we need to replace this with um, hashtag uh, 3B7E 
and 20. Cool. But now wait, that didn't do it. Why didn't do it? Uh, replace the user value three B seven E and twenty and C C for the alpha channel. Let's see. Perfect. And finally, for the blue markers, box shadow property, replace the name color with the HSL A function, user values 223 for hue, 59% uh, for saturation, 31% for lightness, and 0 0.8 for the alpha channel. So let me see. And this is the final step in this project. Yeah, um, so for the blue markers, Bruce, place the name color with the HSLA function. So we need to replace it with the HSLA. And then do that. Use the values 2 to 3, 59%, 31%, and 0 0.8. There we are. And this Yay. is what we've created with this. So let's just check your code that should be fine yep um we are done that's the next project the registration form which we will be doing next weekend yeah next weekend next Saturday. so that is going to be fun we're going to do that all of that uh other passwords yes okay <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I'll do this, um, you know, obviously kind of uh, live, but yeah, it's just um, that, that's uh, that's essentially what we're going to be doing next next week. little we're preview of gonna... what's coming. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks for joining me, Connie. It's been yeah. great. And then we'll, yeah, see you guys in the next one. Bye. Thanks for joining us. All right.